and my husband was working for electrical company. He was the one who was in charge of the capacity for electricity. Because, of course, I was seeing going up and down to go to check what is going on. And at the end is when they started saying that that load shedding was caused by him being bought by Robert from Uganda. And at that time, we have never seen those people, we have never met them. Only hearing talking about them on radio, but he was saying that he was working for them. That is the time when my family started being um, abused, tortured, because they, and we were at that time busy having big project for our family. We started building a house. We were, we were, we were thinking ahead and planning everything. So now it was 1994. 1994, the year started, it, there was those rumors saying that things are not good and that they need a negotiation between the rebel and the government. In February of that year is when they started now, they removed my husband from the office because they, they went to see him, beat him and say that he was working for the people from Uganda who were attacking Rwanda. And at the end, they even took the keys. They asked him to leave the place. So, January, February, March, for 1994, things changed. And there were no, no food. You can see that people were hungry on the road. We were having many, many refugees all over. And on the weekend of the 3rd and 4th of April, it was Easter weekend. I remember that my sister's, my sister's son was baptized and we met the whole family for the party. And we were planning that we will always meet, but it wasn't the case. Tuesday the 5th of April, I went back to work. That time my husband was no longer working. I went back to work and then I was working for that insurance company. It was the big company, insurance company in Rwanda. And they said, someone came at our work who was our neighbor. And you, before he left, he came to me and he told me, Do you know after work, go and do your shopping? I said, Why? I said, Because from tomorrow, Nobody will go out. I took it as a lies or something which is not true. On the sixth of uh, on the sixth of April, again I went to work, and the godfather of my husband, who was also the husband of the sister in law of my sister, waited to come to visit us. In the evening, we said, okay, let's go to a restaurant to eat. There is a restaurant which was called Baoba, which was not far from our house. We went there, we had our supper, but around 9 o'clock, around 8.30, there were many people in that restaurant. We saw people leaving one by one. And we were saying, what is going on? At the end, we were remaining in the restaurant alone. The few people, my husband, my his godfather, and the ourselves. And we asked the owner of the place, we said, what is going on? Why everyone is leaving? 
He told us that the bread of the president has been shot. That was like the thunder which hit us. What we did, we just left, went home, we tried to listen to the radio, there was classical music. We didn't know what to do because now we started hearing noise all over. We didn't know what to do, we didn't know, there was confusion, fear, and we, we were asking what, what we were going to do. Everyone was traumatized. We couldn't even sleep that night. And that time we were having two children who were two and three. The night, now it was the next day on the 8th of April. Sorry, on the 7th of April. Around 10 o'clock, we had a very big bank noise on our gate. We were having a security in Rwanda. You can have you have a security who will open for you when you get in and out and also sleeping. And also in Rwanda we're having two domestic workers. So I need to look after the ch the children and they wanted to cook and they do washing and everything. So we have asked the security at the gate not to open for anybody, anybody. But those people, they said, we must open, if we, we don't open that, they are going to jump over. That is what they did. They were soldiers, armed, and they got inside. They started shouting and swearing and they, they said, we want to search your house because we know that you have been working for the Rwandan Patriotic Club and that you got, you are the one who I accomplished with the Medal of the President. We said that we don't know anything about it, but they did believe us, they took all sorts of cases down, all the cut, they took everything out. Because my husband was waiting the night shift every time and he, he, going all over when he was, he was still waiting. He, he, he was called sometimes at 3 o'clock in the morning when there the was road shedding at the high profile people. He was the one who was intervening there and helping him. So the government at that time had given him a gun if something happens, which I remember he never even carried it once. It was always in the suitcase. They found the gun. And they said, you see, now we have proof. We have proof that you are among the people who had meetings to kill the president. That time they did not even allow us to talk anyway. And they threatened, uh, threatened us, saying that they were going to shoot us. But we said, please, can we give you something so you can stop? They said, what? We took money, we gave to them money. And now they left. They left and they were thinking that we are done. In the afternoon, about three o'clock, the same people came. Other people, also soldiers, they would be jumped over. They said, what have you done? They said, nothing. They said, no, you are the one who killed the president. You must also die. What are you doing here? Also, they started to um, swearing at us, traumatizing us, abusing us. But them also, they left. Because it was the second time, we thought that it's finished for There is no one who come back, we are now safe. The 8th of April, 
Now there was a big, big group of soldiers coming. They came inside and they asked my husband and the visitor who was at our house to go outside to the garage and they kept me inside the house. Thank God the two times were sleeping. When I did not want, I was saying that the next thing I would hear shooting the, them outside and me, I didn't know what they were going to use me. They took guns on me. One in front, at the back, back right. They took me to the bedroom. They said, show us everything which you have used to shoot the plane. I said, we don't have anything. They said, no, show us the, we were having a big, big house of six bedrooms. They took me to all bedrooms. They were, took out everything which others had done as well before and nothing was found. And immediately they said, so we, we are going to kill you. You don't want to say what happened and you, you know that you are part of them. For the first time is when I felt like a very powerful feeling in my heart. I was no longer scared of dying. And I said, I'm not scared of dying, but give me time to go to pray and ask for forgiveness of my sins. I said, I want to go to the city to where he these two big pictures. That's why I put them there. He said, Let me go in front of Jesus and Mary. And he asked him to receive you after you came. And he said, always you are using God to, to, do, uh, to kill people and everything. So I said, no, just give me time and let me finish to pray. The time they were discussing, one of the guys said, oh, you guys, don't kill her. Don't kill her, let her be killed by others, not us. Others were saying, no, why do you want them to keep them? But the time we were talking like that, all our neighbors, you can hear the screaming, you can hear the people crying, you can hear the dance, the firing noise, you can hear all those bad things because we were staying in the houses of the that company which my husband was working in. And there were many houses like those town houses which were together. So all of them they think that uh, they said, okay, we are leaving you. But if you want to leave, you must leave this place immediately. Because people coming after us, they won't let you go. They left and but when I went outside to look for my husband, they were not, and the visitor, they were not there. I said, if they take care of them, what? The domestic worker told me, no, they, when they were outside, they were beaten, they stepped on them, you know, those soldiers' shoes, how hard they are, and after they took them to the toilet, they went to the little toilet, and fortunately, we were having an attack. We opened for them and I told you, they said that we must leave this place immediately. But where were we going to pass? Where were we going to, to go? There was a Catholic church which was not far from our place. It was like 10 minutes walking. We said, oh, let's go to the Catholic church and maybe they will help us. But was it the right decision to take? Unfortunately, God saved us because we said, no, let's just leave it for other places where to go. So we left home. We put it, what we took, we took only our children who were sleeping. We didn't take 
not even across the lacking because we're saying the third we go, we don't get to the public. That noise which was in the whole of TBI, it was something scary which we didn't want to carry anything. What we wanted is to save our lives. And you know when someone is at home is wearing like some light clothes sometimes. I for, I, I forgot something which I wanted to tell you which I was hearing. And if you see it, it we took out, it's very old. And it, we, we just left, walking, not knowing where to go. And we decided to go to, there is a, a, a city, in Tigali there is a place where they were collecting you, it was like a small town, a small town. And there they were at the French Embassy. We said, let's go to that place next to French Embassy to see if maybe they can take us. When we arrived, we see that old trucks, which were selling before we have left. But we, the place to, from our place to that place was full of bodies. Many bodies all over, children, women, men, some children who were sucking the mother's breast when their mother had died. Sucking the dead body without knowing we know. It was something which was scary. Which really those images of those bodies which we skipped, we were walking in. We never is a carefully flower plant. So we decided now to, we didn't know which place to go to. At the end we said no, we can't stay in Italy because bombs were falling all over. And immediately when we went down, 15 minutes after is when our house was also bombed. It was on fire. Everything was wet inside. All our documents and everything, all valuable things we had. We just decided to continue and the walk and go to go to because my parents were staying now in the north. Said let's go there. It was very hard because the roadblocks, the roadblocks were too many, and all roadblocks we had in the bad experience. I'm not going into details. I read that to my parents. That I mean, we were not even having any shoes left or any clothes. We came wearing one cloth. Not eating, I don't know how we survived. I left that in my parents' house with the children. My husband was left behind to see if maybe something would change and he go to our uh, to check if there's something which he can take, like the document or what. When I left, my mother and my siblings. Who was thinking? Who was thinking with her, our parents? She, she was crying. She was telling me that she has been paying money as well to avoid being killed, and she was telling me, "Why are you coming here? Here is even worse." So we after. It, is when my husband arrived 
And they said, okay, we can't stay here. They said, no, no, please leave this place. It's not good for someone said you can go. Imagine when your parents is telling you something like that. I looked at my mother. And I, we were going to leave and we didn't know where to go. And I said, I don't know if I was here. Now we have to go. To wait, we can cross the border and look for someone else. The image of how she looked in my eyes. With the same tears like I have them now. They are still stuck in my brain. That time when we left this love of God, it will make it through. We arrived to the roadblock, which was not was just next to where the deceased president was. We spent there for hours being tortured, saying, Why are you going? And everybody's checking who are you and what. And we have never been involved in this thing. So we continued, we went, oh, the, God, the Godfather of my husband was now with us, and he said, Okay, I'm going to take you. He was staying in the north now, or in the west of the country. I'm going to take you out like this and let's see how it goes. We were happy feeling that we are going somewhere. But we are not here. Things which were there we always done. Those we left behind. When he was staying, all people had to sleep under the bed because of the killings. You can see a lady who is like 60 on top of the house hiding and sleeping day and night. They couldn't even eat. We slept there, I think, like two days. And the third day, when we woke up, we were surprised to find that we were. I know in the detail that I was convinced it was my husband and my children. We didn't know why we were alone when we said all of them were there. So one lady, that's the, the day before, a lady who was sleeping under the bed said, someone came and said, Oh, I can take you to cross the border. And they, they brought that small Suzuki, they had Suzuki which were in Rwanda, and with the boxes they put her in the middle, and they put mattress and many clothes. And when they arrived at the roadblock, they removed her and they buried her alive. There were those deep holes which they were there, and they put someone alive, and they were stolen it first. They were stoned at the person first, and that's how the, the job was done. And they were also using the machete all over the red machete. I remember that I said, let me go out to see if I can get something. When I arrived at the roadblock, they stopped me. I was with a, a, another lady who was around. And they said, with those machete, with those big sticks, which on top is having something around like this microphone, which they were using to beat people. When they wanted to ask me to write down to start beating me, is that lady, fortunately, you, she was from around, and those people they knew her. She buried them and they left me. 
So we decided that we were going to see if, because we were remaining in the house and we were saying, if these people left and if those killers, they were calling them here, if they come to kill them and they find us, they will be the one who will lift him. We had now to walk to look for other people we knew if we can stay there. But you know, in the, when someone is, in, is having a hard time, even the friends and family, they become enemies. When you are up there to that family, they didn't treat us. We were told to cook ourselves. At that time, we didn't have money. They asked that when they, they were having domestic workers that to wash our clothes. We didn't have clothes. It was like one person for a child for each. And they, one clothes for me. But they were saying we must wash it ourselves when they have been friends for a long time. We decided that we were going to, to leave the country. We said, let's leave the country and go to see if in other countries, the neighboring countries, maybe it's better. When we were planning to leave early in the morning, we had now the, the the noise all over now of people, people walking, screaming, firing. And when we looked outside, they were, the roads were full of people. And they, they said, now killings have arrived to the place next to where we are staying, that everyone must leave the country. We had that plan before, but now we had to live with the mass. We walked in this crowd. It has not been moving. I will sort it out. You will sort it out, Caritas? Yeah. We walked in that crowd. That place is for seven kilometers, which we walked in eight hours. Because people were like ants. And some were even being shot. When we were moving, many had been shot. And again, we will skip the bodies. And you will see stones all over people stoned and everyone and that was like that is the mind of Mamuna which we hear. So we arrived to we managed to cross the border and to a place in the east of Congo or Tigoma. It's where everyone was heading. We found that there was no place, there was no place, there were no way to stay. Everyone was scattered all over, there were too many, and no food, no water, but it was next to the lake. It was only to drink water from the lake. But I don't know how God works, because from that time is when we received the miracle. We went to reset there when there was a hotel outside, there were many, many people. And in the evening, when we were sitting with the children, very tired, hungry, and all, there is a person who came to us and said, Are you sleeping here? And you were in a crowd of people. We said, Yes. He said, Okay, I came for work from Kinshasa, the capital city, and I'm having a room in a hotel. That room is having two beds, I can sleep on one bed and he, you and your children will sleep on the bed, in the, the other bed, but unfortunately the you know, husband can, cannot come in. 
It was much better we went there for the time he was there. And that time we survived. Before he left, he said, there is nothing I can do now because I have to go there. He left us some money to see if maybe we can do something in Goma or if we can go somewhere. And when he left is when we went down to go to, to start sleeping in a garage, a music garage where there were dust and spiders, mosquitoes and all other insects. We stayed there, but we didn't want to use that money without knowing what to do. We decided to to leave and go to another place where they can, maybe we can settle. We were thinking about going to Namibia because before the war, when Namibia received independence, they came to do a treatment to the parties, to my husband, but my husband was having a big, a, a big job, he didn't want to go. It's when he said that maybe let's go to Namibia, that job which they were suggesting to me is going to, to happen. Okay, we left now, Congo. We took a boat, but the boat is like if you saw the boat which uh, was uh, had accident two weeks ago. That there are those boats which are very very old, and we went to another town called Bukavu. And that time I met now with my nephews and my nieces, two of them. We took them with us. We had to go Bukavu because we didn't know where other siblings were, except those who they had told us that they had been killed and they died. So, in Uvi, in Bukavu, the children said that they they would like to stay to look for their parents and stay behind, and we left them there in. A, with the person who told us that if they don't find their parents, he will take them as his children. We just we left, we continued to Uvira, another place where there were many refugees and the, no sanitation, nothing which was really proper. And at the customs now, this way now. Congolese people also became very nasty because they were searching each and every one for men. They will go with the men and they will remove all, all clothes, looking for money. And for women, they will go with the women to remove all clothes and check if we, you have hidden your money to take it. That became also a big challenge for us. We arrived to took another boat which took us to Tanzania. And we arrived there, we said, you know, Tanzania, you can stay there. People, they also were not kind to accommodate us. We continued to Zambia. Zambia, we arrived at the border because we also used the airport. When to get inside, we are supposed to also bribe people. So that money which that they gave us, that guy gave us, was not finished. We had to go to Rosaka, where we didn't have anything remaining with us. But the train we were in, we met a man who we didn't know. But those with the children. I'm sure he was saying, seeing that they were very suffering people because that time we were like 40 kilos each and the children were 
very the children were very very thin because we were not having food, it was just picking up small things which you can find. And when we we arrived to Rusaka, that person gave us a, a took us to a place, it was a motel and he told the owner that we must stay there and do accommodation and food. We must give him a voice. It's when we stay there and then we my son got very sick. He was having cerebral malaria. He was that time of four years. Yeah, no, three years. And he had to go to the hospital. He was admitted in the university teaching hospital in Osaka. But the miracle which God did is that that cerebral malaria for my son is where we got the blessings. In Rusaka, in the hospital, you have to sleep to look after your, your, your patient. And when we were there, we had, there is a, the bed next to my son, there was a, a little girl who was like 11 years old. And she, she was always looking at my son. My son was in a coma and he was almost dead. And he, she would look at me as well and see that I was not talking. And when her sister came to visit her, she asked her sister, please, can you help these people? The sister was a journalist from Letters. And that sister started taking care of us, bringing food to us. And unfortunately, a few days after that girl passed away. Now we have continued in the hospital. We were in the hospital for almost almost two months. Now there is a sister, a nun, who was the matron of the hospital, moving around, helping people. And when she arrived next to me, she started talking to me in their language. I was only holding my rosary. There was no other places I wanted or other person I can rely on. And the, she asked me where I was from, and I told, I told her. Lunch, when it was lunch time, she said, okay, can you come with me for lunch? Because anyway, my son was in the command in the doctor's room. I went with her. And when we arrived at the place where she was staying in a convent, it was a convent in a, with very big schools where the children of Zambian high profile children were studying, having preschool, primary, and high school. They made me visiting around the school. And when we finished to visit the school, the principal told me, Pater, I want to help you by giving you a job. What can you do? I remember the way I was looking, it was like it was people on the street, but I don't know how she offered me that. She said, did you go to school? I said, yes, I did. So, can you teach music? I said, no, music, I don't know music. I said, can you teach French? I said, yeah, that one I can. And I was offered a job immediately. I went to that school and my son got better and better and he was four years but now he was no longer working, he was just back to the crawling. 
I went for three years and we were saying that Bosanga is a nice country. We were just surviving and staying in the, the back room, which those sisters were helping with. But now in Zambia, one day when we woke up again, all our neighbors, we found some other ones there. They have been arrested. Because now there was an announcement that all these people must be arrested and be put in jail. When we knew it, because at that school the principal was uh, was always taking care of me and they, those children were going for to us in all the neighboring countries. Botswana, Namibia, Zimbabwe, South Africa. And always she was asking me to go with them. And when they arrested those other Malis, is when we said, um, let's continue. Uh, it, it, it was time to go to Zimbabwe. And I, I said they already asked permission if I can go with my family so that also they can visit Zimbabwe. Yeah, but the big problem, I'm asking God for forgiveness because I used that trip to free Zambia because of the situation which was happening that time. When the people finished in Zimbabwe, when they were going back, I told the principal, I said, if I can stay behind to visit Zimbabwe and then coming up after a week. But I was dying. I, would, I knew that we were not going to go back. So we said in Zimbabwe, where to stay in what? We said, no, let's continue to South Africa. Nothing is impossible when you are a refugee, but we managed to find a track which can bring you to the place you want as long as you can hide and they put the boxes and they cross the border. We didn't jump the fence, but we used the, those tracks which the, the driver can really see that he's carrying the boxes. Now we arrive to South Africa. Where are we going? Without lying, we arrive to South Africa City. Is there any other way which I can use to go back to Zambia? Because when we arrived, it was again starting like from zero. We didn't know where to go. But from my experience, I said, church is the only place in which I can ask for help. We went to the Cathedral Christ the King. It is in Berea, in Saratoga. And when we were right there, it's when they said, oh, we were asking for help. They said, oh, there is a lady who is There is a lady who is helping refugees and you can contact her. We contacted her and immediately she came to see us, but the house was too full. She was saying, I don't have a place, but I'll make a plan. They had to create a room and they put us in a small room for four of us. It was a house of uh, three bedrooms and the bathrooms to two bathrooms. And that house was having 48 people. It was a place where there was no privacy, where there is, you know, people from all over, different culture, different ones. That place, we stayed there. 
those ending will help to buy supermarkets. You know supermarkets when those food they are going to expire or sometimes expired. We thank them anyway we did have better than that. And also the the church was always giving us food parcels every time. It was also very tough because it was impossible to leave a child behind because of the people who were in that house, especially when they were different types and you don't know them. I started looking for a job and the first one which I found was to, to do domestic work. I was doing domestic work and you know when you have to, to to do the washing, cleaning, sometimes gardens to pick up the pieces for dogs and everything, but I didn't complain. I knew that maybe it's what I I have to do. So I started also teaching French, always the lady in charge of that house is the one who was speaking to people. Yeah. Okay. Ten minutes. Yeah. We, uh, that is a leopard messy house. I think this is the time we were there like about um, in 1998. We, I, that my husband also was doing the driving things where he was also carrying the sands to the, for building the swimming pools. Afterwards is when we, I, I decided to, to go to school to see if I can, to go to school if I can get a job, a proper job, because I was giving my CDs but no one was calling me. I decided to do the catering, hospitality and catering services, I finished. Even if I was the top student in that year, everyone got a job except me because we never got the documents. When the home affairs, they would give us always the asylum seekers. But it helped me because I used to do the private event and also to earn small money which was, we were using to help us. We moved from that house, went to, to stay in the back room because now I, some missionaries came and they opened a fresh which they asked me to work in and it was something small but we survived. After working in that fresh for six years is when we were no longer managing to to survive because I was getting 2,000 rent and then there was nothing big which was used with that one. I decided to resign and start looking for another job. And I took nine days to pray for that job to see if you I can really get it. So things happened that the, uh, in the church of Bruti, they advertised my name, they put my name and advertised me saying what I started and everything because I did the management in high school, in the Tessian school. 
and I received a call from someone telling me that you must come for interview. It was now Henry Business School. I started there. I didn't know that really it was true because when I went for interviews, they were not even interviews done. It was to show me what to do. What had been happening is that getting a job was very good, but the big problem it is the side of the xenophobia outside. Because we had many experiences where people they were using us to use you and do whatever they want for our interest, for their own interest. And the people think that we came to South Africa because we we want to get money, want to steal the men or women, or we want to everything which is which is a negative thing, and they think that maybe from Rwanda. Living to Rwanda is because we couldn't maybe live the life we wanted. But in Rwanda, we were living a proper life, which someone asked me, Did you hear the wedding? In Rwanda, they do a white wedding. I was laughing at me, or just you met your husband and you started living together. That's why I put this photo to show people that also we had weddings in Rwanda. And another thing is that the documents, we don't have the documents. We only have those. We've been 22 years in South Africa, we've got all this permanent residence. But we have accepted it. This means we moved. Sorry. So, being a Belgian, refugee status changed my life for being satisfied with basic needs, feeding my family, having shelter, and having water. That's what I feel very important in my life. I developed new qualities of being compassionate, having a helping hand, and merciful. And uh, I learned a lot of lessons. Respect for everyone, regardless of who they are. I remember we used to take our domestic workers like slaves. And we, I saw that when I became one of them, I said, that's what it is. To be humble, to recognize my value, working hard, to believe in myself and to love one another, assist the needy, and always prayer. Prayer is the solution to everything. I can say that we are not rich, but we are not poor. We are just coping with our lives and we are very we must be very grateful for what is happening in our lives. <laughs>